Welcome to Coffee with the Sarlows. We are your hosts of the show, Karen and Kelly Sarlow. Whether you're struggling with grief or you just need answers, we connect you with spirit to find relief, clarity, and direction in life. We can help you move forward. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. I have a tough show today for anybody who um, is afraid of losing their best friend. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't start that way. So let's start from the very beginning, which was when I got up in the morning and I was just straightening my hair. And I all of a sudden can hear a whole conversation going on. Now, I want to stop here because when I was prepping the show with a friend, she said to me, well, hold up. Is that like when you're in the shower? And you have, like, you carry on a whole conversation in your head with somebody that you're mad at. Is it like that kind of thinking? Or is it like when you actually have a radio playing and you're in the shower and you can hear it like outside your head? And I thought, "Hmm, that's a really good question. And I said to her, for me, it was like hearing it inside my head. And she goes, that's really complicated, Karen. She goes, I don't understand then how you know it's a conversation that somebody else is having and it's clients versus that you're just having your own thoughts then. And I said, that's fair because sometimes I don't know the difference until I'm in a session and the spirit guides say, do you remember that conversation when you were straightening your hair this morning? And I say, yes. And they go, that's her. And she goes, oh my God, that is, that is a different, difficult and different kind of life because you're sometimes waiting to place a conversation mm-hmm. and sometimes you, like, do you just think that's just in your head and you wonder where it came from? And does sometimes it just not get placed and you never know? And I said, that's correct. <laughs> it's, um, it's a messy situation and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. So anyway, I just thought I would explain that in case people wonder, what is that like to hear a conversation like that? So I want to explain first about the conversation because obviously you're hearing that later in the day when a particular client called, I got told, this is her, this is the conversation you heard. So it starts and I hear, oh my God, my best friend has just died. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I can't stay in this marriage without my best friend. What the hell am I thinking? Like total, total panic at the very beginning of listening to this. And then I thought, hmm, well, I know that's not me. I don't think that's anybody that I know around me. So I'm starting to think, hmm, is this the client stuff? I have to really pay attention and not do my own daydreaming. So then I go back and I'm paying attention again as I'm doing my hair And I hear, oh my God, I hope to God that Karen's going to be able to tell me what the hell I'm supposed to do. What the hell? Maybe she'll be able to channel her. Maybe my friend will be able to say something to me that's going to help me. Like, what in God's name am I going to do? Then I hear the conversation shift and it's not just her and her thinking and what she's hoping. And I hear her and what I believe are her spirit guides. And I hear a different kind of conversation. And I'm thinking, oh, there's a shift here. I've got to remember this stuff too. And I hear her saying to her her soul, if you want to call it that, or her guides, why the hell did she just die like this? How could she do this to me? And she's livid at her friend for dying. What the hell am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to go to? And her spirit comes in and says, why should you be going to somebody to get all of your feelings out when it's sadness and anger and frustration and disappointment instead of dealing with it with your partner, with your husband? Why should you be going to your friend? So I found, I found this really cool, Cal, because I could hear her soul trying to put these thoughts and these questions into her mind now to have her question herself in a way she hadn't when she was with her friend, before her friend passes. And I thought, that's really cool 
to be able to hear how your soul is trying to get you to ask yourself helpful questions, healthy questions, when you've been in an unhealthy pattern and you don't want to hear those types of questions. So when we go into our avoidance, and I thought, oh my God, I so get this. Same. Yeah, I think a lot of people listening to this can go, oh shit, yeah, (laughs) and totally feel that they understand how when we want to avoid something, we we purposely don't want to hear those questions, even if another person actually asks us those questions. Mm-hmm. I, you're giving like a, a really interesting example because it's it's a an extreme one, right? Because it's your partner. But this happens in the workplace all the time where maybe you don't want to confront the fact that you need to leave because it's a toxic environment, but you found a work hubby. Or a work wife that makes it bearable. Or a work bestie that you're like, we can get through this together. As long as they're here, I'll be okay. But we're avoiding the idea or the the reality, pardon me, that work is not a safe environment or um, an environment for growth, potentially, or going to allow us to become the best version of ourselves, whatever your your values or focus might be. Um, So I think for people listening, hopefully you're not just thinking about a partner. You're also thinking about where else do I avoid um, the reality of the situation. And because another person loves me and meets my needs, I can stay in this shitty environment. So we're in survival mode instead of thriving mode mm-hmm. is what you're saying. I'm just mm-hmm. recapping what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the guys are saying all of these things to her, trying to put these thoughts into her mind about, well, why are you tolerating what's going on in your marriage anyway? Why do you put up with the patterns that you're in? Do you see the pattern? Can we point it out to you today? And I can literally see the pattern that she's in. I left. I moved on with my day. I saw a couple of clients. And then mid-afternoon, and I think it was somewhere in the middle of seeing clients, I was at the very beginning of a session just going through consent when the spirit guide said to me, it's her. And I thought, okay, this is going to be the whole conversation that I heard earlier in the day. So I went through consent, and I'm going to call this client Mia, and are just giving a quick reminder, or to brand new listeners today, we do not call our clients by their names. It's confidential, um, their identity. So Mia is a made-up name. So Mia goes through consent at the beginning, and she gives me consent for everything. And she asks for an open session, meaning that she's asking the spirit guides to offer anything they want to, which I found typical of a lot of clients that actually are calling because they're looking for something. Like Mia is really looking for something after this conversation, right? There's She has problems. She has pain points. She has issues where she's really looking for help and she's hoping to get something, but she's not saying that. She's not bringing it up. She's not directing it. She's saying, go open. And the guides immediately said, no, this is not open. She has a full agenda. She's hoping that you're going to know this agenda. And it's a little bit of testing you. She wants to see if you know what's happened in her world, and she's really hoping that you're just going to blurt it all out because she's hoping that if you can do that, then it's going to give her the belief in something, and I'll say the spirit world or what I'm doing or whatever, so that she can take a different action in her life. And I thought, okay, let's just give it a try. I'm just going to go ahead and do this. So I said, me, I said, you're asking for open, and the guides are saying, that is not what you want in the least. And she just looks at me very blank looking like, oh, shit. I said, can you give me a minute? I want to explain something. I, and she goes, yes, go ahead. I said, and then what I told you about the hair in the morning, and as I was doing this, that I could hear she had lost her best friend. And she goes, yes. I did. I did. This is me. This is me. And I'm like, okay. And I need to clarify with you because while you've just lost your best friend, and I'm so very sorry to hear this, it's not really medium that you want right off the bat. bat. 
you're looking just to figure out what to do and that you're in a mess. And I said, so you actually have two different things that you're looking for today. And she goes, yes. And the mess is the most important thing, though I still want to know about my friend. And I said, okay, we're going to start with that because that's actually what the guides were addressing. I didn't actually get your girlfriend coming in. And she goes, oh, well, that's disappointing. I thought you were a medium. And I said, I am. What I'm saying is, is that I can do it for you, but I can't do two things at once. I'm saying that we're going to repeat the conversation that you had with the guides this morning and where I heard them saying that they wanted to change the way that you're thinking and they want to challenge you because you've been in a pattern in your marriage. And she goes, yeah, 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 that's true. What's that got to do with my girlfriend? And I said, it has everything to do with your girlfriend because you, and then, and now let's break it down. I'm just going to break all of this conversation down. I said, you are in a marriage and have been in a marriage with a man who does not listen to you, interrupts you, talks over you, uh, criticizes everything that you say, tries to undermine you. She did not understand undermining Kelly, so I had to break it down. You listen. literally just listed four things that undermine a person. Yes. Okay, thank you. And... I had to go in and explain and give her examples of how he undermines her. And I referred her to Patricia Evans' book, The Verbally Abusive Relationship. And I also, and I said that in her book, one of the forms of verbal abuse is undermining, but that she could also find undermining on YouTube, Instagram, um, Google, like that she could find it in a number of places, that she could probably find podcasts as well as books on it in a variety of ways. Because she's somebody who says, I don't read, I'm too busy, I have kids, it's, I don't have time. So she's saying, I don't have time. And the guides are coming in and saying, this attitude of I don't have time, this core belief is the reason that you that you give to yourself to stay in a relationship that is unhealthy. And so we are saying that there are multiple ways that you can be busy driving your car with the kids in it to go someplace and still listen to something on the radio or a podcast or YouTube, whatever, where you still can educate yourself so that you can get the right tools and the right knowledge to be able to deal with what you're going through in your relationship in a far healthier way, and you've been refusing to do it. And she goes, oh, okay. I don't have time is not a core belief. It is a core excuse. Oh, thank you. That That's... Thanks, Kelly. We Yeah, we have time for the things that matter. I love how you've fully put that right out there really clearly. So that anybody listening to this might go, oh, got caught there. Well, and let's break it down. She has time to complain to her best friend. Yes. She has time to reiterate all of the stories. She has time to lean on and ask for enabling from her best friend. She had the time then to research, to educate herself. Okay. She chose to use it in a different way. I don't know what to say right now because this is one of my hot moments where I both love you and can't stand you. Yeah, I know. Because you just took my whole podcast. Oh, it's fine. Oh, you know what? Efficiency on a Saturday morning is not a bad thing. <laughs> so if anybody wants the short version of our show, you just got it. <laughs> Carry on with your day. <laughs> Love you. Go do whatever you're doing. For any of you who are like, wait a minute, I need some more information and I'm addicted to Kelly. <laughs> I'm addicted to how she gets right to the point which is awesome. And I'm addicted to the fact that Karen can also give the story mm -hmm. and that you can listen to both and walk away and get a little bit of both if that's your, your flavor <laughs> or the way you learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Kelly, this <laughs> I feel like all I'm going to do now is repeat and drag out what you've just said. <laughs> so the guides brought in all kinds of information for her saying, look at 
when your husband undermined you here, he did this to you, then you went into your avoidance of dealing with him. You took all of your emotions and bottled them up because he brick walls your feelings. So when you go to emote, he says, can't you just get to the point? Or why can't you just, why can't you just say this without getting upset? How come you, but he's allowed to get upset. He's allowed to be emotionally dysregulated. But when she responds or reacts to his behavior and to her own feelings about how she's being abused, he attacks more so that she just feels crazy and shuts down. So she takes that shutdown. She sits on it. Then she goes out and I'll say texts, phone calls, whatever to reach out to her girlfriend who is making herself more and more and more available because she feels, the girlfriend, feels that my friend's in an um, unhealthy, or she doesn't call it an unhealthy relationship. She just thinks the guy's an asshole. Same, same. <laughs> So she just keeps making herself more available to her friend. Well, hang on, back up. That's a, that's a key moment in the show here. Yeah. If anyone's listening to this and is like, well, I mean, my friend's not in an unhealthy relationship. He's just a dick sometimes. Same, same. You like you can't just be like, oh, yeah, they're, they're an asshole sometimes, but, you know, isn't everyone. Like, no, there are actually good, kind people that don't say things they don't mean that don't lash out, that actually sit and pause and can be reflective in the moment and work hard to be a decent fucking human being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So the pattern then is to reach out to the girlfriend. The girlfriend then responds immediately, which is then the enabling. She starts it. And then they make their plans and they converse over texting, they converse over phone calls, um, they get together, they FaceTime each other, they Zoom each other, they have found every means possible to um, to continue the pattern. Okay, so then we've got a really unhealthy girlfriend yes. who's now dead, um, who needs to be needed. Yes. She's getting her thrills and her fills by being needed. And so if I make myself more available, I can keep wearing this very, very important hat. Yes. And she doesn't have to ask for what she needs. Yes. And then it's a great relationship for the girlfriend because, as you said, she doesn't have to identify her own needs in relationships or in her own life. She gets to focus on somebody else. She has no partner. She has no kids. So she gets to uh, do, ex uh, do exactly what we've just been saying. So I explained this to her, and she goes, this is really true, but it sure doesn't sound good. No. And I said, good, I'm glad that it doesn't sound good to you. And she goes, well, I just feel full of shame. Is this the whole point? Like, did I call you just to feel shame? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm going to continue channeling for you. You can decide what you're feeling. Okay, hang on. Karen just lied there. Like... You know damn well she didn't just call you to feel shame. That's never what the guides want. That's never what we want when we're channeling for someone. Mm -hmm. If she needs to finally sit in it to learn something and be productive with shame, okay. And we're talking about the like feel it for 10 seconds and decide mm -hmm. that you want to do something different with it. We're yeah. not talking about, you know, dwell on it, right? We, we want it to be a catalyst for change. Exactly. Thank you. So I went back and said, and continued the session and said, okay, so once you are with your girlfriend, you take all of your dysregulation and you give it to her. So you unload it. And then she tries to pacify you in any way she can. So she's determined to make you come out of it feeling better, but she's always waiting to see what looking, what feeling better will look like for you in that particular conversation. So if it's to bash him, she'll bash him with you. If it's to problem solve it by going and picking up your kids for you because he won't, she'll go pick up your kids for you. So she comes in and does and picks up the jobs and the responsibilities 
that he should actually be doing. This is the need to be needed. Yes. Let me be the hero of your story. Yes. So that I can have your love and affection and praise. And she, Mia, certainly gives that to her constantly. I don't know what I would do without you. You're the best friend. Um, Like totally feeds that. But then it allows Mia to now go back and look at her at her husband and no longer be angry he didn't pick up the kids or pick up the groceries because her friend has done all these things. So she can release the anger that he's not responsible, that he is not accountable, that he is not actually partnering. Okay, so nothing got released. Everything got buried. Right? She thinks it's released, so that's why I want to use that word first. I'm but talking to the you. fucking listeners. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nothing got released. Yeah. All of it got buried. Yeah. She thinks it's released because there's the surface. There's no more problem in the moment. But I, because the dinner's now on the table or the groceries are there or the friend picked up her kids or will drive them or do whatever. So she thinks things are smooth. And remember, she's in survival mode. Yes. So if the problem got fixed in the moment, but not the actual upstream problem, yes. right, the source of the issue, then she's just like, that's enough. That's, that's fine. I'll take that. That's right. And this is, it's described to her in detail during the session that this is all staying in a survival mode, that none of this is about thriving or actually being in a healthy relationship with her partner or with her friend. And it's that it's also affecting how the children see their father, their mother, and the best friend, and that they are now seeing the best friend as the dad. So at that point, Kelly, I stopped and I checked in with her and I said, I'm going to do a quick check-in. Is this meeting your needs? And she goes, yes, it is. She goes, and all of a sudden, she says, as soon as you said about my kids, seeing my best friend as their father, she goes, something in my head, like a switch just turned and I'm just totally getting what you're saying. She goes, I don't know why. She goes, but all of a sudden, I'm like, I'll call it proper ragey. She goes, because I'm now ragey at my girlfriend. And she goes, and I'm ragey at my partner, and I feel ragey at me. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I can see that we have three freaking unhealthy adults. Who the hell is parenting these kids? Mm -hmm. And I said, that is exactly the guide's point, is that there are three unhealthy people here, and that these children have nobody around them that's actually showing them healthy parenting skills. And she went, oh, my God, Karen. She goes, I just learned about these attachment theories, and now my head is spinning because you're now talking about these attachment theories, and it makes sense to me. And I said, I'm not going to go into any of the attachment theories today because we don't have time. If it's something that you want to understand more deeply, I suggest therapy. Attachment styles. Pardon me. Thank you. I said, go to therapy so that somebody can actually help you figure out how you're creating your children's by what all three of you are doing. Mm -hmm. So we left, we left that, but oh, thank God that she actually had just heard about them, but she didn't understand what they all were yet. So she had prom or not, I won't say promised me. She had just made the comment that she's more interested in it now because she's able to place something. So there's one more thing that the guides want to point out at the, uh, that happens in your cycle is that, Once your friend has done all of these things and helps you um, dismiss and avoid the reality of what's going on in your home and in your your relationship, but also in the way that your husband is not healthily parenting, you go into this thing that's called limerence. And she goes, what's that? And I said, it's a state of hopefulness where you hope that he won't do it the next time and that you can actually get through it. And I said, because there is the odd occasion where your husband does show up, he will go get the kids, and you think, oh, okay. And it gives you this ability to be hopeful that at some point he will do that again. And she goes, yes, everybody does that. She goes, that's just life. And I said, no, <laughs> I said, it is not. 
I said, and it is actually not healthy to do it. There should be consistency and communication between you and your partner, not the irresponsibility and dropping the ball where you're trying to pick it up with your girlfriend or your girlfriend sees the holes he creates and then runs off and does something and you go into the hopefulness that even in 15 minutes that he's actually going to step in and actually follow through and do something. I said it is that bad that it's on a minute to minute basis. It's not just even that he does shitty things once in a while or once a day. It's frequently, every day. And she goes, yep, that's true. She goes, what's it called again? And I said, it's called limerence. And I said, it's this, it's this false state of hopefulness because he future fakes you. Okay, I don't know that false state of hopefulness is um, going to resonate that much. Can we can we do mm. that a different way? Yeah, like it's it's tough to describe, right? Because mm -hmm. hopeful is this wishful thinking that things will be different, and when we are hopeful about someone's behavior, where we don't know what a pattern is, or we don't know what the pa their pattern is then hopeful can be a genuine thing, mm -hmm. right? We can have a conversation and, and it's more of a we'll see kind of state, um, which sounds a little less optimistic and more pragmatic, okay, or more realistic of, you know, let's talk about how, how that didn't work or what didn't work and let's talk about what we want that to look like next time and we'll see if they're going to do things differently, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's a healthy level of hope, but also pragmatic, versus I'm very aware that their pattern is to not follow through, to not be accountable, and I'm going to still let them have the opportunity to do something different next time, mm -hmm. hoping, wishful thinking, magical thinking, that is just somehow the stars are going to align and they're going to be in a better mood and they'll do the follow through. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Like when we know someone's pattern it's it's not a false state of hope. It's actually a denial of reality. Right. Does that make yeah, sense? Better said. Thank you. And we're just we're just crossing our fingers in a wishful state, trying to forget about the pattern that we know to be true, to mm -hmm. say, I really wish they would do something different this time. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna let myself get set up for this disappointment all over again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's good. You did a great job of explaining it. So we had to talk about that during the session, and I did have to explain that to her, but also told her there were resources to go out and look at the books and look at different resources, or if she's going to go into therapy, to bring that term up so that the therapist could sit with her and explain it and show in detail, pick apart some of the patterns, pick apart and look at the percentages if they want to, as to... I think the guide said something to her about what percentage do you think there's a likelihood he will follow through? And she came back and said something to me like, oh, 100% no. And I said, then that's when there's limerence. And she said, well, and, and maybe some other days, you know, I might give it an 80 or a 70, but never more than that, that he's not going to follow through. But I'll even argue that you put in the word think. What percentage do you think he's going to follow through versus tell me what the actual stats are for his follow through? Well, we did talk about evidence and that she actually had to look at the evidence to come up with her percentage. Yeah, otherwise you're on a Likert scale of how limerent you are. Exactly. So we talked about it in terms of what the actual evidence looked like. Okay. Uh, thank you for breaking that down too in, mm -hmm. the, in this conversation. The guide's strongly suggested therapy because there were so many terms in her session, so many resources in her session for her to break down. And um, we I'm going to leave it at that for now because it moved then because she stopped me and said, look, at, I've got a lot of information about that and clearly I'm in a relationship I shouldn't be in. Clearly my girlfriend and my relationship with her has created really a really bad home life for my kids. So the writing is on the wall. She says, and I feel like, um, she says like my head is just doing a 360 because 
because my girlfriend's died, she says, I, I realize I can't hold all of this together. And you're basically saying and explaining me to, to me today that I shouldn't be holding any of this together. And that at this point with my best friend dying, this is my crossroads. You're mm-hmm. basically saying that I have to wake up right now. And the cost of me not waking up is that I'm going to stay in this shitty marriage. I have to find a new best friend that will do the very same as what my old best friend was doing, which, you know, I might be able to do, I might not. But in the meantime, I, I know that I can't even maintain this one day without my best friend. Because if my best friend went on holidays, I always said, I got to go with you. Mm-hmm. So then she said, can we check in with my best friend, please? And I'm going to call her best friend, Jen. So her best friend came in and said, I've been listening to all of this. And I want to say how freaking sorry I am. I had no idea that my own shitty behaviors was making everything worse for your kids, making everything worse for you. Him? I don't care. Mm-hmm. The partner, I don't care about your partner. He's an idiot. I've always told you that. Can I? Can we talk about a different kind of example where this would have been actually an okay situation? Sure. Just so people understand that we're not just like shitting on every friend who colludes your reality. Um, mm-hmm. In the event that Mia was not able financially or physically to get out of this marriage, where she didn't have a choice and needed to stay for a period of time... Mm-hmm. Talking to a best friend to say, look, I don't have the means to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, I need I need to stay in this house or I need to stay with this partner for a period of time till I can get on my own feet. Um, can you be someone who partners me? Can you be someone mm. who is there for my children? Is that a role that you are able to play so that I can take the actions to get out while I stay? Right. So whether that is putting your savings together, whether, you know, that is, you know, meeting with lawyers to get information and education so that you can leave in five years from now, because mm-hmm. y- you can take a lot of steps in the meantime and stay because the kids need what they need, et cetera. Right. Mm-hmm. So it could have actually been a relationship where if that was the need, then Jen, this is what you're calling mm-hmm. her, then Jen could have been that person who said, absolutely, we can do this. We can get you out alive, even if it's a long-term goal. Mm-hmm. To not assess if she can leave, to not assess her resources, to know if that's possible or when it's possible, then it's an unhealthy colluding of reality and just allowing or enabling this to continue. Mm-hmm. Right, Jen. Jen could have actually been a great hero of the story, and allowed Mia to be a hero of her own story as well. Mm-hmm. Had they had some different conversations and goals, yep. Rather than I'm going to complain and um, build myself up to say that I'm right, but also stay in a situation that's so wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Now people are going to see you for one more reason in this show today. Oh, while you, hate you, you hate, I hate you yeah. and love you. All right, cool. <laughs> because Jen says, I am so sorry. What I did prevented you from taking the right actions mm-hmm. and feeling forced to take the right actions. Or where if had I been a healthier person, where you and I could have worked this out and been actual healthy best friends instead of what Jen referred to as unhealthy best friends. Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't understand why that is, unfortunately, when we were talking about Jen not being able to ask for what she needed, she needed to be needed. And she let that be the focus of their friendship. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing the situation that Mia was in and having the strength and the security to be there for her in a way that didn't do on her behalf, Mm -hmm. but held Mia accountable to take the steps that she needed to for herself and for her family. Instead, Jen actually quietly and subtly made it all about herself. Yes. And Mia thought she was being a great person and that Mia was the focus. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the focus was Jen. Mm -hmm. So Mia says to me, I feel like I was undermined by my best friend and my husband. Mia? Yeah. Yeah. She goes, I feel like, you know, she says, we discussed at great length earlier the undermining. And she says, I feel like I was undermined by both. Yeah, because if you let someone stay in their suffering or you help keep them in your suffering so that you can be needed, 
that's absolutely undermining your life. Mm-hmm. I mean, I started with the big one there. Your skills, your intuition, your intelligence. We can go mm-hmm. on and on. Mm-hmm. Then Jen says to her, because we were just about running out of time. She says, Mia, she says, your next best friend will be Mandy. And I, as soon as I said that, you I picked, heard... You picked that name. Pardon me? You picked that name. Oh, I picked Mandy. Yes, that's, not, that's a made-up name. Yeah. And it, both women started laughing. And I said to Jen... Why are both of you laughing at the choice of Mandy? And she goes, well, you guess, Karen. You just guess. And I said, oh, because Mandy won't tolerate this shit. And she goes, that's right. (laughs) She goes, Mandy will not tolerate this type of behavior. Mandy did not like how I, as Jen, enabled Mia. She would always give me shit and say, well, you want to go and pick up our kids? Don't whine and complain to me about how much you're picking up her kids. You go pick up her kids because that's what you want to do. And so Mandy was always telling the truth and pointing out the unhealthy behaviors to Jen. And so now Jen, dead Jen, knows that Mandy is the healthiest one in the group, but the one that Mia and Jen would avoid telling all of this shit to. Of course. When you don't want to be held accountable, you know what friend to call. And you know which person to avoid. Absolutely. When you don't want to actually do the work that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so at the very end of this conversation, Mia looks at me and goes, I got my ass kicked today. I got my freaking ass kicked, served on a platter. And she goes, so some of my takeaways here are that I have time. I've been saying I don't. In reality, I do. I'm saying I don't because I'm in avoidance. That's number one. She says, number two, call Mandy. Mandy's going to tell me what's healthy. Mandy's going to tell me the truth. She goes, so Mandy needs to be the new go-to person. But I'm also learning that I have to actually ask Mandy because you're saying I need to speak to her and put all of this out there properly that Jen and I didn't do that. And we fell into terrible patterns because we weren't clear about what we needed from each other in a relationship. And I said, oh my God, Mia, you're doing super well. And she goes, Karen, I think I need to re-listen to this many times. She said, because there was so much in this between what I need to know about my own behavior in the past, the old Mia. She says, so going forward then, anything that I would normally do is old Mia. And the opposite of that is going to be new Mia, because that's going to be the healthier stuff, because I wasn't choosing the healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. And she says, and then I will check it with Mandy, because she will tell me when I'm not being healthy. And she says, and now I need to understand that that's actually the wor- that's actually what a best friend does. Yes. And notice that nowhere in here have you said judge. Mm. When you tell someone what is or isn't healthy, mm-hmm. that's not you passing judgment on them. That's you offering them a fact. That's you offering them discernment. If they want to take it, great. And if they don't, that's their unhealthy choice. I don't need to take that personally. They don't need to take that personally. Everyone's got free will here. Everyone is seemingly an adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the very end of the session, Mia said to me, on behalf of my children, thank you, Karen, and please thank the spirit guides. Please thank whoever spoke to you in the mirror this morning when you were straightening your hair. Please thank Jen. I understand she's starting to do her work on the other side. I will do mine on this side. Hmm. Cool. And and the friend the friendship can grow. Yes, that's right. And then the friendship can become healthy, which is I know what you mean by it can grow. Hmm. That was fun. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. And thank you so much for um, jumping ahead and telling the story without knowing that you're going to tell the story and explaining things so that people listening to it can really find um, the benefit out of a friend like Jen and a friend like Mandy Mm -hmm. and how those types of friends can either invite us to stay stuck and unhealthy 
or to become healthier people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a wonderful Saturday. Thanks for listening to Coffee with the Sarlows. If you enjoyed the show today, help spread the love with a like, share, or review of the podcast. See you next Saturday with a brand new episode.